so yesterday uh, towards the end of the lecture we were discussing about uh, water's ionization ion product of water <coughs> ph etc okay so we'll continue on that today to weak acids and um, their behavior and uh, as a consequence of that the buffer system and how buffers are important in biological system so these are the things we will discuss today so so these are the same slides i showed yesterday um so I, the this cartoon explains um the range of ph of the common items that we encounter every day all right so unlike the strong acids remember yesterday i was telling a strong acid or a strong base is something that completely dissociates like hydrochloric acid uh, as a strong acid example and sodium hydroxide as a strong base example so in in the in case of strong acids one molar dissociates into one molar protons um, example in hcl H2SO4, of course, one molar uh, H2SO4 will give you two moles of, uh, sorry, one mole of H2SO4 will give uh, two moles of uh, protons. And that is where we bring the term normality to uh, describe acids. So today we are not going to look at the strong acids. In biological systems, the most important kind of acids are the weak acids. So weak acids uh, do not dissociate completely. So that's the only difference um, and the primary difference. And we are going to look at the uh, consequences of that uh, characteristic. So uh, for example, a weak acid here, HA, dissociates partially to give H plus and A minus which can again combine to form HA. So it is in an equilibrium, like A plus B giving rise to C plus D, and uh, equilibrium constant is C times D concentration divided by uh, A times B concentration. So very similar logic here. So uh, in a product of the uh, these two divided by this uh, is the equilibrium constant. And for an acid dissociation, we call this as uh, Ka. This is the dissociation constant for an acid. So, and a negative log of that, just like we took negative log to the base 10 of hydrogen ion to uh, hydrogen ion concentration to talk about pH. So, negative log of uh, this uh, equilibrium constant is a term called pKa which we will often use um, in discussing weak acids. So the main uh, point to talk about this is this acid which um, can donate a proton um, and the resulting base, okay, this A minus, this acid and this base, this is base because it can accept a proton, okay, in the reverse reaction. So these two, this acid, weak acid and this base that is formed as a result of dissociation of this acid, these two together we call as conjugate acid-base pair. So this is a conjugate base for this weak acid, um, HA. So like for example, sodium, uh, sorry, uh, acetic acid dissociates into protons and acetate ion and that acetate ion is the conjugate base for acetic acid okay so here are some examples of um, uh, weak acids and with their um, uh, pKa values given so here you have acetic acid uh, its pKa value is 4.76 what it means we go back and look at this when uh, concentration of the numerators and the denominator are equal, um, so then uh, that uh, the, that will be the point that pKa indicates. Okay, so in this case, 4.76 is the pH at which these two will be in equal concentrations like the dissociation will be half of the acid and similarly 
this combining will be half of the concentration of this so that a halfway point whatever be the ph at which these two will reach halfway will be the pka so that will become clear when we get to an equation that talks about this feature so so at 4.76 ph this would have dissociated 50% of this would have dissociated that's what it means while this one to dissociate 50% the ph will have to be 9.25 so this does not readily yield protons so this is a base okay so that, that that's clearly indicated by this pka value now you look at the other one like carbonic acid uh, its pka value is 3.77 that means even at a lower ph than the one for acetic acid 50% of this will dissociate meaning this is a stronger acid than acetic acid and uh, you look at glycine which is an amino acid you know nh2 ammonia uh, amino group and then the carboxyl group so this this its r group is another hydrogen therefore this is written as ch2 okay so this one uh, here the carboxyl group dissociates at 2.34 so you pay attention to this this is carboxylic acid group which is the same as the carboxylic acid group in acetic acid but you see this will dissociate 50 percent at a much higher ph than this so the carboxylic acid in glycine is more acidic than the one in acetic acid so you look at the difference between the pka so again pka represents the ph at which half of the molecules the acid would have dissociated so lower the uh, pka value that means uh, stronger the acid uh, strength of the uh, acid strength of that given acid so this difference is primarily i asked you to do this as a homework you read it for yourself um i guess i leave it at that i'm sure some of you will be curious and read and figure it out that way you will remember it better than me uh, right away giving the answer and this one interestingly has another group that can be uh, protonated or that can donate a proton depending on the ph and that will dissociate at a much higher ph because it's a base group so at 9.6 half of it will get dissociated meaning in the surrounding medium the proton concentration has to be so low for it to dissociate um then you have a situation so th these are the diprotic acids you have two groups that can be protonated or can dissociate okay so triprotic acid the most common example that we encounter in biology is the phosphoric acid we have already seen it in the context of phosphodiester bond in the nucleic acids and we also saw it in phospholipids so this has three acid groups you know uh, it's 3po4 so each one of them have different characteristic pka values so the first one dissociates at a very low ph indicating it's a stronger acid group and then next one at a higher ph and the other one is really at very high ph it's nearly behaving like a base okay so this h3po4 and h2po4 can act as conjugate conjugate acid base pairs okay and this h2po4 and then this hpo4 can act as conjugate acid base pair so this will be acid this will be base and for this this will be a conjugate base and so on okay so an important aspect of weak acids is the the titration curve shape so here all that we are doing is we are titrating acidic acid so you are taking concentrated acidic acid and there you and then you are adding so uh, hydroxyl ions let us say we are adding sodium hydroxide which will readily dissociate and give hydroxyl ions now that will make the ph to increase and as the ph reaches uh, a point where this carboxylic acid group will dissociate it will start dissociating 
You see, as you add the hydroxyl group, the pH increases. And after increases to a certain level, it does not increase that rapidly. The, you know, the slope starts to decrease. And then you reach a point where half of the acid is dissociated um, and therefore the concentration of the acid and the conjugate base are same. At that point, the pH is equal to the pKa, 4.76. So at that midpoint where these two are equal, the pH reaches the pKa for that acid. And the main point we really need to pay attention to is this shape, this, um, you know, this range, like marked here, 3.76 to 5.76. In that range, for the uh, quantity of hydroxyl ions added or the base added, the pH does not proportionally increase. It sort of resists a change in pH in this range. Okay. So revealing that the dissociation of weak acids can actually reach a buffering, uh, uh, you know, it sort of uh, brings out a buffering ability of the, these systems. This conjugate acid base pair uh, resists change in pH when the pH is near the pKa value. Okay, so. Um, on both sides you have some leeway but this is the midpoint where the change is really really the lowest so so this is the basis for the concept of buffer so buffer is a solution that resists change in ph when you add a certain amount of acid or base it is not going to tolerate forever if you add a lot of base then it is going to dissociate and then the ph is going to start to increase again and similarly, in the opposite direction, again, if you add uh, acid, the it's not going to resist continuously forever. Once you go beyond a certain level, then the pH is going to start to drop. So in a narrow range, depending on the molar concentration of the buffering uh, system that you have, it will uh, resist the change of pH uh, to a certain concentration of addition of acid or base. So this is a uh, same thing, titration curve for different uh, weak acids. So the difference is they all have the same shape, but the difference is they are kind of upshifted if you are going from acetic acid up towards, um, you know, th this uh, ammonium uh, solution, or if you go in the opposite direction, then it decreases. So in this, uh, in this graph, among these three examples, acetic acid is the strongest acid, which dissociates at a lower pH. But the point is all of them have the same uh, shape indicating a fundamental relationship, a fundamental principle that govern the uh, dissociation of weak acids. And that is essentially uh, the two main points, that is, when the pH reaches a point where uh, the concentration of the acid and base are equal, that is the pKa value. And second, around that range, these systems resist change in pH when acid or base are added. So, so this is the you know coming specifically to the buffers. So buffers resist uh, change in uh, pH. So how does that happen? When you have an acid, when you add base to it, then the proton is taken up by this, converting into water, and therefore the pH doesn't change because the proton has been taken out. And similarly, when you add base, sorry, in this is the proton, and here when you add the negative charge, the hydroxyl group, it is taken out. So in this case, proton is taken out by the base, conjugate base, making it into acid. So this, these two reversible equilibrium is the, you know, with the characteristic equilibrium constant is the reason why these systems behave as buffers. 
if they weren't having this ability to partially dissociate this partial dissociation is the principal reason why we are able to reach a situation where the reversible situation becomes possible in the case of strong acids where they completely dissociate th this is not uh, going to happen so to uh, to rearrange this equilibrium constant in a way that becomes practically useful to calculate the different uh, entities uh, like for example how to determine the pka value or how to find the ph if i know the pka value and if i know these two then what is the ratio of the uh, acid and the conjugate base so for those calculations um it really becomes useful when it is rearranged into this form and this is called the Henderson Hasselberg equation okay this relates the pH pKa and the um, ratio of the conjugate acid and base so this is quite simple you start with this equilibrium constant that we are all familiar with then you rearrange it for um, H plus um, then you take negative log on both sides then you you know change the sign uh, then you get the this equation pH equals pKa because negative log H plus is pH and negative log H Ka is pKa and then um, so this you can rearrange to make it uh, uh, A divided by HA so that's what is here so it becomes plus changing the sign here okay so proton acceptor divided by donor so this equation is very useful like for example if you know these ratio you can readily calculate um, pH if you you know th since this is known for all um, acids weak acids already and similarly if you know these two you can calculate these ratios and this helps us to make buffers you know what kind of what in what ratio should I mix the base and acid to get a certain pH and also given uh, the react the type of reaction you want to do uh, what is the pH range in which you want buffer action and if you know the pH range in which you want a buffer then if you know the pKa value of many different uh, conjugate acid base pairs and you can choose the right one where the pKa will be near the range you want for, for example if I do a reaction let us say um uh, let us keep this so i'm going to do an experiment where i want the ph to be somewhere around um, five okay uh, then i know pka for acetic acid is like 4.76 close to five and therefore this will be a good buffer around the range i want so i will take this as the buffer but not this one because this is not going to behave because it will already be fully dissociated and the pH will readily increase so it is not going to act as a buffer at the pH that I want so so knowing all of this helps us to uh, make the right buffer right concentration all of that so the specific uh, once you determine the range in which you want and select the acid and even within that what ratio do I need to take to get the right pH to of the buffer so why do we need to worry about buffer so much you know our goal is to understand the chemistry of living systems uh, the primary reason is the living system deals with a lot of protonation and protein proton donation uh, and those things are critical for reactions and as a result the hydrogen ion concentration becomes uh, very crucial and if the hydrogen ion concentration is crucial then uh, maintaining the hydrogen ion concentration in a certain range meaning a buffering action is also important so a lot of constituents of our um, polymers themselves can act as these conjugate acid base pairs for example you look here look at the side chain of an amino acid um, so this is uh, histidine, this is imidazole ring. So here you have um, you know, a group that can donate proton and it can accept proton. Okay, so this forms an um, conjugate acid base pair. 
So like this, there are many other groups. There are other amino acids as well that can do this. Um, and uh, individual amino acids have two charged groups. We already saw it in the glycine. You know, the um, amino group can be protonated to NH4, and the carboxyl acid group can dissociate proton. Um, so you have two groups already in every amino acid, but of course they are going to participate in the polymer, like in the peptide bond. But the side chains, like this imidazole group, and the lysine in um, sorry the amino group in the side chain of lysine, and um, you have uh, aspartic acid, glutamic acid having carboxylic acids in their side chain. So an arginine, the guanidino group in arginine, all of these are charged molecules that can act as weak acids and bases. Um, that is one. And second, um, our enzymes, each one has a characteristic optimum pH at which their activity is maximum. So that is shown in this uh, graph. So you, if you take pepsin, so the pepsin is an important enzyme present in our digestive juice that digests the proteins that we eat. The protein components of our food gets digested by pepsin. That works at pH 1.5. That is where its activity is maximum. At neutral pH, it, it's basically no activity at all. On the other hand, if you take the intestinal alkaline phosphatase, which removes phosphate groups from variety of molecules, that works around you know 8.8 .8 or 9 uh, pH. That is where its activity is maximum. And at 1.5, it's not going to be active. Like at 4 itself, it is zero. On the other hand, trypsin, that's another protease, uh, that works uh, near at, at about the neutral pH. So each um, enzyme has its own characteristic pH and therefore the hydrogen ion concentration becomes very important. So when you purify the, these enzymes and use in molecular cloning or other uh, biotechnology applications in the lab, uh, you will make the buffer that is the right one for a given uh, enzyme that you are working on. Okay, so, the, so the, 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 this, the previous graph tells you the importance of the pH for the enzymes and the enzymes being crucial the importance of pH for the life as a whole. But in the uh, one before, I told you how there are uh, charged groups in our biomolecules that can act as um, weak acids and bases and therefore some buffering ability uh, in them. But they are not enough to handle the large uh, volume of uh, proton formation and consumption in our whole system and for that there is a really sophisticated buffer system that exists in our blood and that is the uh, carbonic acid okay H2CO3 so this one can dissociate forming uh, this uh, bicarbonate ion and proton and it can also dissociate into CO2 and water. Okay, so essentially, when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, you form carbonic acid. Okay, so the concentrate that the beauty of this buffer. Okay, uh, before I explain and make you appreciate its sophistication, let's look at a normal buffer. Okay, so. Let's take, for example, yeah, let us take acetic acid. So if I have a certain quantity of acetic acid in the solution, let's say I have uh, one molar acetic acid, 100 ml. Now it will start to dissociate as I add sodium hydroxide. When it is completely dissociated, then that, that's the end of it. Okay, when it is halfway dissociated, uh, and if I continue to add sodium hydroxide, then the pH will start to climb. So it can't resist the pH change anymore. Uh, and there is no way in the middle of this reaction I can vary this concentration or this concentration. They, they are fixed. Whatever I started with, that is what is going to be there in the solution. 
um so if i want a higher buffer capacity that is if i want more sodium hydroxide addition to be tolerated without ph change then i should start with a higher concentration of acetic acid so that is how you decide whether you want 10 millimolar buffer 100 millimolar buffer 1 milli 1 molar buffer and so on so that the concentration of the buffering molecule uh determines how much acid or base can be tolerated so if you want to increase the quantity of the uh addition of acid or base to be tolerated then you have to increase the concentration of the buffer okay so that is automatically possible in the case of carbonic acid simply because our lungs can you know uh take in required carbon dioxide to make more carbonic acid or they can throw away carbon dioxide to reduce the carbonic acid concentration so this concentration can be dynamic and as a result this can have a flexible ability in terms of its buffer capacity buffer capacity can be increased or decreased it's not fixed and that is purely because of this uh, uh, reaction 2 reaction 3 equilibrium here okay so that is why this carbonic acid forms the main buffer of our blood so carbonic acid concentration in the blood can be readily varied by taking in enough of this gaseous carbon dioxide into the, the dissolved form or dissolved carbon dioxide into gaseous form so you can tweak the concentration of the carbonic acid so that is the uniqueness of the buffering system in our blood and this is what helps us to really uh, act as the main buffer of our bio, our, our uh, physiology okay so these are the equilibriums that are easy for you to understand you know you have a uh, reaction 1 to uh, equilibrium here and then here why an equilibrium here in equilibrium so you can have a uh, 2 4 6 rate of reaction equations and three equilibrium uh, constant equations and that is what is shown here k1 k2 k3 okay and uh, so all of this put together really makes that buffer system very sophisticated each one can be tweaked so so we are still all through we are at, although we are talking about a proton donation accept uh, proton acceptor conjugate acid base we are actually appreciating the beauty of the water molecule in all of this it is the water okay so water is where the acetic acid is dissolved or diluted or carbonic acid is present etc so it is all still connected to the um, um you know our conversation on water that we started two lectures ago so in addition to all this uniqueness that comes from the electronegativity of that uh, oxygen uh, atom in the water molecule water actually participates in the reactions themselves okay it is not just an enabling environment or enabling medium this is also a reactant okay a substrate for an enzyme and so on so those examples are given here okay um so here you have a um, uh, you know anhydride bond between two acid groups getting hydrolyzed so this is um hydrolysis with where water is a reactant and condensation reactions where the rivers would be condensation atp formation okay um inorganic phosphate and adp condense to form this releasing water and oxidation reduction reactions there again water molecules participate so in this manner water itself is one of the reactants uh, in biological systems so organisms over the course of evolution have exploited the uniqueness of water uh to adapt to environments okay there are many many uh adaptations uh, that we find 
or you know you, you like for example you sweat and the evaporative cooling cools your body and helps you to maintain a constant body temperature and that is why people say you know in hot weather a, a sweating is good so if it is hot but not humid you actually can have heat stroke if it is hot and humid where you sweat and do evaporative cooling you don't dehydrate readily and um, your um, body maintains temperature and similarly transpiration of um, in a, in a water from uh, plant leaves uh, helps them to uh, you know control their processes and uh, when the surface of the water bodies freeze um, because they are exposed to cold their atmosphere the ice that floats on the surface because ice has a certain fixed orientation of the water molecules due to that the density of um, the water molecules are not tightly packed as a result they are less dense than the liquid water and the ice floats on the surface and that acts as an insulation and prevents water below the surface and that protects the living or uh, beings in the uh, at the depth of the water bodies so like this in many different ways uh, organisms have adapted themselves uh, to these unique features of water so if you are going to find organisms in an area in a foreign plant planet uh, where the solvent is not water and those organisms may have nothing to do with us at all so they may not have any resemblance to us on the other hand if you are going to find organisms which resemble the ones in on earth that means that environment is likely to have water okay so so water is everything right so now what we are going to do is we are going to move from water to uh, the next um, major um, you know macro molecule that we have already seen but now we are going to get into details of it and that is proteins so the, the 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 reason is from proteins we are going to move to enzymes and then we are going to learn about how biocatalysis and a thermodynamics etc work and that is the reason we are beginning with proteins and then we'll go to carbohydrates later so our goal is slowly move into enzymes uh, because enzymes means then we will directly be talking about um, biochemical reactions and when we are going to talk about biochemical reactions we can also uh, hand uh, there itself we can discuss the um, energy transformations in the biological systems because that happens via biochemical reactions and therefore we can try to think about and understand how the laws of thermodynamics are obeyed by the biological systems and also we can learn about the kinetics of biochemical reactions and that will set the stage to discuss metabolism okay so let us begin with proteins so all of this will look complicated but if we go one topic at a time these are all easily understandable um you know intuitive uh, concepts so you will not face any great difficulty in understanding these concepts okay so we'll go one at a time so we already know the um, proteins are catalysts and in addition they have structural role defense role all that we saw they have diverse biological functions and uh, they are polymers made up of amino acids and amino acids are joined by peptide bonds right so now let us look at uh, an amino acid closely so the shown here is a generic amino acid where the side chain is denoted by this letter r and uh, um so this is one specific amino acid the lysine i mentioned uh, earlier that it has a charged group in its uh, side chain so this r group is what i keep referring as side chain and um so this carbon to which these are all added we saw uh, is a chiral carbon except in the case of uh, glycine where the r group is another hydrogen and this is how the numbering works the carboxyl group is number 1 
just like in um, any aliphatic acids, carboxyl group, the functional group is where we start. But by convention, people started earlier this central carbon, central in terms of the moiety is attached to it as alpha carbon. So therefore, we have two concurrent, um, you know, naming uh, schemes here. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, where one is the carboxyl carbon and an older convention that is still continuously used, like for example, structural biologists will always refer this as alpha carbon. They'll say C alpha bond and the NC alpha bond. Um, so when they say this uh, alpha is this carbon. So going by that, this is alpha, beta, uh, you know, gamma, delta, epsilon. So this often this is called epsilon amino group. Nobody is going to say um, sixth carbon amino group. You know, the, uh, most of the people will talk it as epsilon amino group of lysine. So therefore try to remember this and it's a um, relationship to the more standard nomenclature, which is this one uh, carboxyl group being one. So, so I already told you that um, ca alpha carbon is a chiral center. Let me make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, so you can have a little bigger picture. Yeah, so, so alanine has the slightly more complex group than glycine. Like in so hydrogen here you have a methyl group. And um, so depending on the orientation here, you could have L alanine or D alanine. Okay, it talks about the orientation of uh, these groups around it. Like, for example, if you see uh, the relationship between these two, if it is opposite orientation, then it is one uh, version and the other one is the other version. So L alanine has this orientation and D alanine has instead this orientation. Okay, so this is ball and stick. And this is perspective diagram where you see this carboxyl group and methyl group are away from the plane of this slide. And these two are projecting from the plane towards you. So the, these two groups point away and these two groups uh, point towards you. So essentially these two are opposite to these two. Okay. Uh, so that, that is indicated uh, by this angle here too. So, so the, this tells you about little bit about the stereochemistry of amino acids. And the other thing you want to pay attention is these groups can have different um, dissociation. Like for example, here both are fully charged. And um, okay, so in this it's always fully charged, but you can have a situation where this is protonated and this is not, so neither having a charge. Um, and this also dissociated and having negative and this is negative. So various combinations of charges are possible. When the positive and negative are equal as shown here, it is called a Zwitter ion, okay? Zwitter ion spelling will come somewhere, so I won't take the time to write it here. Um, so where the acid and base charges, like the, the net charge is zero, you call that as a Zwitter ion. So this slide shows you the different kinds of amino acids that are present. So I told you in the, uh, when we were discussing about proteins initially, that proteins are made up of 20 different amino acids. So this uh, table lists all the 20. So you have uh, non-polar aliphatic groups uh, like for example alanine and then to alanine you add two more methyl groups you get valine and you uh, add one more CH to extend this chain then you get leucine slightly rearrange it and you call it isoleucine and instead of one methyl one of the CH2 you have a sulfur then you get a methionine and then you make it as a chain with this um, 
amino group so this is basically an amino acid because there is no amino group because this amino group has become amino by this inner internal uh, ring structure and that is a proline okay so these amino acids including glycine do not have any charge or polar groups on them so that is the characteristic of all of them and therefore they are the non polar aliphatic uh, amino acids then you can have aromatic ring in some aliphatic ring like phenylalanine just the benzene attached to this um, you know methyl group like you take alanine and then one of the hydrogens of the methyl group is replaced with a benzene ring that's phenylalanine have a phenol group instead like with a hydroxyl group then you get tyrosine and instead you have a different ring uh, aromatic ring like the indole ring you get tryptophan so these are the aromatic amino acids okay so of which one of them this is a polar uh, because of the hydroxyl group being present um then you have a um, polar uncharged ones uh, like in so being totally hydrophilic you can have um, a hydroxyl group on the side chain like serine threonine um and uh, cysteine you have an sh group here in sort of so the methionine and cysteine are the ones that have a sulfur in them okay um so then you can have an amide group in so co nh2 asparagine and with one extra carbon then it becomes glutamine so these are the amide groups so either you have to uh, either you have an amide group or a or you know all sorry hydroxyl group or you have a thiol group so these are the polar ones and then you have charged ones basic like lysine asparagine and histidine so these are the basic uh, this is imidazole ring guanidine and this is simply an amino group here so these are the basic amino acids and then you have the carboxylic acid containing ones aspartic acid and glutamic acid so these are the uh, different side chains and based on the chemical properties of these side chains we have grouped them into five main groups okay so if you go through them these are not difficult to remember like if you just look at them once and pay attention to progressive increase in the number of uh, moieties added and then if you know the functional group based classification you will readily be able to remember all the 20 like for example these four are related aspartic acid this carboxyl group you convert into an amido group it's asparagine this one you have to have one extra carbon then it is glutamic acid and then amide form of that is glutamine okay so like this you will be able to easily remember there is no excuse for not knowing the 20 amino acid structures and calling oneself a graduate in biotechnology okay or biochemistry or biology or whatever anything starting with bio and if you have done a four year degree you should be able to write all the 20 amino acid structures any time even in the middle of sleep if someone asks you to write you should be able to write um so i'll stop here today and uh, we'll continue our discussion on proteins in the next class